Welcome to Immediate Review. And uh, we're doing our top 10 of 2010. We're a little late, but screw it. <laughs> These are our uh, top 10 favorite films uh, from 2010 to 2019. Not greatest, favorite. We didn't watch all of them, so there's <laughs> probably a lot of shit missing from our list. But uh, yeah, we haven't t uh, shared our list with each other, so uh, yeah, this let's is more, go. Yeah, this is more about just everybody getting a chance to see what our perspectives are on our on movies. Uh, would you like to go first? Uh, sure, uh, yeah. Start with your honorable mention. So yeah, uh, we're, we're going to have one honorable mention here as technically the number 11. Um, there were a million movies I could put here, um, uh, specifically horror movies, that I really, really wanted to put in this slot. But I, I couldn't justify myself to do it because of this movie, The Cabin in the Woods. Oh. This movie influenced horror in just the best way. Yep. It, it had just all of the, the cliches um, packed into a parody horror that just completely uh, put just all of the cliches yeah. into the face of filmmakers. Don't, and don't, was like, don't spoil it, by the way. Careful. In case anyone hasn't seen yeah, it. Oh, I, I, I won't. But just said, just said, you know, like, don't do this anymore. Yeah. And the, fuck, did they listen. Like, they fucking listened. And yep. we got just so many amazing horror movies over the next, like, I think six years. Um, I'm not I'm not sure exactly. Nine years. That came out in 2011. So, yeah, nine yeah, dude, years, man. It's, that's it's right just, when shit it's, changed. It's... The, the only movie that, that I could put as my honorable mention. Yeah, no, I it, it truly is an overlooked, like, cultural shift in the horror genre. Um, and, uh, yeah, it was poorly marketed. I, I, every, everybody thought it just looked like another stupid teen cabin in the woods slasher. And uh, because they didn't spoil the twist. And, ugh, if, if you think that, go watch it. Um, yeah, I remember Person A watched it like twice in the same day, and then like I came home and they were just like, "Oh, we we, we gotta we, you gotta see this movie." <laughs> My honorable mention is Steve McQueen's 2010 films, um, Shame, Twelve Years a Slave, and Widows. Um, yeah, I just uh, I think Steve McQueen's my favorite new filmmaker from uh, the past tenish years. But uh, I just, I couldn't put any of these movies on my top 10. Uh, you know, I love Shame, but not really on top 10. Yeah, no. 12 Years a Slave, incredible, but it's just like, I wasn't feeling it on my top 10. And uh, Widows, phenomenal, one of the so, best heist so movies good. ever. And I just was like, I don't know. It's, uh, but yeah, that's... Uh, my honorable mention. I'm so glad you put it there, man, because, like, I, um, yeah, I, I skipped C. McQueen on my list, and, man, I, and now that you mention it, it's just like, damn. I don't know what it is. I can't, I can't explain it. Like, all of his movies are phenomenal, but I just, like, I like, I like these ten more. <laughs> You're n -n 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 number ten. <clears throat> Alright, number ten. Okay, so, uh, most of you guys know I love anime, and I, I have to put, as my number ten, Alita Battle Angel. <laughs> um, Alita Army, I'm with you, all right? <laughs> but, uh, yeah. yeah, this movie's great. I'm sure pl plenty of you guys have heard about it, so I, I won't go into too many details, but this movie is really good. Why do you is, like it? People really hated good. it because they think the CGI is Uncanny Valley, and it's trying to set up a universe, and it's bullshit. What do okay. you think? Every anime is Uncanny Valley. All right, get over it. Okay? <laughs> Just because it comes into the fucking... Uh, the, the film world and whatnot doesn't mean that, like, every fucking person that was a cyborg in that looked fucking weird, okay? It wasn't just Alita. And I think Alita Alita worked, and she, the actress was fucking incredible. Rosa Salazar. And it just, the, the story was just a, a total fan service to the original anime Gunnam. Uh, and it's just like... You know, if if that's what you want, it's it's like it took all of the best stuff and put it on screen and took away most of the like crazy like screaming that was in the actual anime. Like, there's some crazy. Screaming. They improved on Ido um, a lot. Yeah, and just like you made him like more of like a person and less of like a rapey fucking creep. <laughs> you know, and just it's just so amazingly good. And uh, the story progressed perfectly, and I really hope they make a second one. You know, there's a chance they won't, and uh, I I really hope to see it. I hope so too. Robert Rodriguez, he killed it. Um, it's the best Robert Rodriguez movie 
Sin Sin City, I think, honestly. Let me check. Yep, checks out. Oh wait. Oh, Planet Terror. Never mind. <laughs> <laughs> okay, my number ten is uh, Mad Max Fury Road. Um, yeah, I made the mistake of not seeing this in theaters. Um, it is absolutely phenomenal. George Miller came back. He he hadn't worked on a Mad Max movie in thirty years. He directed Happy Feet One and Two, Babe, Pig in the City. And like, it's just, it just seems like George Miller was never gonna come back to that. And he's like 76. I can't remember, I can't remember his exact age, but. Uh, I didn't know any of this. He's, he's in his <laughs> 70s and he came back to do Mad Max 4. And my God, he killed it. Like, absolutely. And everyone's like, oh, no Mel Gibson. I don't know if it's gonna work. And fucking Tom Hardy's like, I'm gonna fucking kill it. What do you think? <laughs> and, then, <laughs> and then it was amazing. I just, uh,. Uh, yeah, um, what's her name? Furiosa? Furiosa's awesome, and, um, it, Important Joe fucking Mediocre! It is just, it is great. Uh, all the stunts are incredible, and, like, the fact that, like, 90% of it is practical effects, and, you know, I, it, it's just, it's amazing. I put it at the bottom of my list because the color grading is too much. Um, they just, they overdid it with the color grading. It, the, the oranges and blues are so intense. Uh, and, uh, yeah, I'm pretty sure that's why George Miller released a black and white version. Because there are times, like, the fire looks like CGI. Because a lot of people were skeptical, like, oh, this, I, I, a lot of this looks like CGI to me. No, it's because the color grading yeah, is post -process, too yeah. intense. There, there was it, some artificial sharpening on it, too, yes, you can tell. And it makes things look fake. And in this film, that's a huge mistake. Because people need to know... Uh, the, the, it was all real. They yeah. fucking really had those giant fucking cars driving through the deserts I, and shit. I questioned it too until I saw the behind the scenes footage. Like the Doof Warrior, uh, when you see him on that with all the cars in the background, and he just goes, and the, the flame shoots off. You're just like, mm, that's touched up. And because it just doesn't look real with the color grading. And uh, yeah, so check out the shiny and chrome edition of uh, Mad Max Fury Road. All right, my number nine is, uh, and I almost forgot to put this one on the list, but uh, mid nineties. Mid nineties. Um, this just, I, you know, it's it was a, a limited release. I'm pretty sure, and that's why I a, I, a, I, a I missed yeah. it on the list. But it's just, it's such an incredible film. This was Jonah Hill's uh, kind of directorial debut. Um, I believe he shot it in 16 millimeter. He did. Um, and yeah, it's just, it's so raw and gritty and real and just portrays the, like that kind of just growing up in the nineties so incredibly well. And, you know, it's just like, what, what more can I say about it? It is, it is legitimate, a masterpiece. And I was like shook after this movie like i i had to sit through the entire credits and just like process everything that happened and yeah it just it blew me away and i recommend that you guys check it out for sure my number nine is uh the 2018 adaptation of suspiria yeah um wow you know i was a strong hater on this when they announced this i was like what the fuck they, they are going to redo Dario Argento and put, put the chick from Fifty Shades of Grey in it. And it's going to be bullshit. And when I say I love Suspiria, everyone's going to be like, oh, that, I saw that movie. And I'm going to be like, no, not that one, this one. And I don't know. I just hated that it was that they were remaking Suspiria. Um, and I was so suspicious, and I just didn't think it was going to happen. Before you go further, the the trailers did not make it any better. Like it, the Suspiria, the original, is so beautiful. Exactly, and, and, and it's just this muted bullshit. And and I uh, yeah yeah <laughs> sorry. No, 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 go ahead. That was it. Yeah, when I saw the trailer, I was like, really, you're going to drain it of all fucking life, and like, but. Um, but no, I we we went we drove up uh, to Portland three hours to go see it at the Hollywood Theater, and it was phenomenal. It was exquisite. Um, two and a half hours. It was long, but it was so satisfying. So good. The acting was phenomenal. I had no idea idea Tilda Swinton was playing the old man. Uh, they kept it a secret, and 
I had no clue. And they got Jessica Harper to come back and play like uh, their lover. And uh, they 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 uh, took aspects of all three films and just uh, combined it together beautifully. And they they paid homage to the original without just rehashing it. Um, and and they built their own thing without being disrespectful. Like there are so many times when horror remakes are just like, yeah, we're gonna call it your movie, but we're just gonna do our own thing and fuck you. Uh, but this wasn't that. It was. Uh, this is just an epic, exquisite, masterful, passionate remake of Suspiria. Um, and yeah, I, I I loved that it um, it didn't try to um, like redo the the re- the climax reveal from the first yep. one. It's like it yep. completely lays that plot point front and center right at the beginning and just lets you know that this is this is a this is Suspiria but this is this is a different telling of yeah. it and it's just it's done oh, so well the I, choreography is oh, yeah. so good yeah and in regards to like the muted color grading muted isn't a bad thing it's just when i'm comparing Suspiria to Suspiria at the trailer I'm, that was my first thought but watching the movie it's phenomenal it it looks amazing and there are scenes where they do use stylized uh, colored lighting. Uh, but yeah, the color palette's muted and it's gorgeous. Uh, uh, my number eight. So this one is um, the only horror movie that I decided to put on the list that uh, wasn't my honorable mention. Um, and I think that uh, just it highlights this new wave of art house horror perfectly and i just love it to death the lighthouse the lighthouse the lighthouse okay. i thought you were gonna put get out on there but the no, lighthouse no, the, was the uh, lighthouse yeah because you watched i remember you watched like get out like four or five times yeah. in the span of, I, like, I, 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 <laughs> wanted, I, I i really did want to put get out on here honestly but um yeah it was just like this one just takes the artsy to the next level, yep. and that's what I was focusing on for this slot. Um, but yeah, Get Out's amazing. Um, watch that movie. <laughs> and uh, yeah, so The Lighthouse. It's just fucking just so good. Just a tale of fucking two sea bearers. Yeah. Just uh, going fucking it, mad it, it's on bad an luck island. To kill a oh, <laughs> bad luck, kill a seabird. And Jesus. <laughs> <man, laughs> <laughs> <laughs> like Willie Dafoe, like he eats dirt on this straight up. They like he just straight up. We we have a review. Go check it out. It's amazing. Uh, but just I I just love this movie, and I and I had to put it on the list. I had to. Um, so yeah, there you go. It's excellent. Um, that was almost my horror movie too, but I chose Suspiria. <laughs> my number eight film is uh, Paul Thomas Anderson's The Phantom Thread. Uh, boy, I slept on this one. Um, it was. Re- I haven't seen it. It was released in 2017. Hollywood th- showed it on 70 millimeter, and uh, I didn't go. I just I was a fool. I, I actually just watched this like a week ago, and um, I I just found it to be one of the most original and interesting um, films I've I've ever seen. It's basically it's um, Daniel Day Lewis plays a dressmaker, a very, like, stuffy, controlling uh, dressmaker. And he likes to get, like, female assistants that he kind of um, controls and manipulates and uh, tries dresses on. They're basically... The model. For uh, yeah, and, and they work... Um, they they uh, walk the runway. And um, it's basically... The, the most I'll, I'll get into in terms of spoilers is uh, basically... Uh, his uh, his uh, <laughs> the his assistant is tries to uh, poison him. She tries to poison him, and it it doesn't go the way you think, and it is just it's it's marvelous. Um, and uh, yeah, Phantom Thread. I uh, I love it. I, I yeah. <laughs> All right. Okay, um, my number seven. So, um, is the only superhero movie you're gonna get out of me? Okay. Um, this movie, uh, I think 
the 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 best description of the movie was when we went to Seattle to see this movie in seventy millimeter. Um, guy comes out to introduce it, and he says the amount of people in this theater, which there were only about like twenty, is not equivalent to how good this movie is, and everyone clapped and cheered. And uh, yeah, my number seven, Wonder Woman. <laughs> um, so yeah, this movie is just incredible. I, I do have to say, I, I I enjoyed Aquaman more um, than this one, but I can't ignore the impact that this movie had. Wow, like, damn this, dude! This movie put DC back on the map. This is your favorite list, not your greatest, but thank you. Man. Yeah, <laughs> um, and yeah, it's just this this movie just like set an amazing foundation like if Aquaman came first I would have been like what does DC think they're doing thinking they can get away with fuck with this like a fucking just crazy ass fucking battle and just huge fucking fantasy thing the things like it's like fucking Lord of the Rings but fucking with Aquaman you know it's crazy and I I would have been totally against it if they hadn't done Wonder Woman first but they 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 laid out. It's like this, here's fuck here's DC. Like here we are, fucking Wonder Woman in your face, <laughs> fucking tanking machine guns with her fucking shield, man. Like going against the grain and just like being just just like everything about this movie. Like the like the fact that it had a female director and just like was completely female centered was just it blew the industry away yeah. in the best way. And in it, a good way, not in a cynical way. Yeah, like it, and it, and it needed to happen. And it's just like, she, she's the perfect Wonder Woman. Like it's, she's fucking perfect. Like it's, it's just, yeah, Wonder Woman. Fucking, this movie's amazing. Without a doubt, it's, uh, yeah, I, you know, I, I'll speak on it. Maybe I'll speak on it later. My number seven <laughs> is um, Martin Scorsese's Silence. Um. Yeah, this this was a film that I was uh, skeptical of when when I saw the trailer. Um, it's about like Andrew Garfield and Kylo Ren as a priest. You know, I know it's Adam Driver, but at the time I was just like Kylo Ren as a priest. And uh, it's like they go to Japan and they're they're gonna convert a bunch of people to Christianity. Uh, I was just like, that doesn't sound like a fun movie. <laughs> and uh, I, but. Uh, last day it was in theaters at, at Regal. I was just like, oh, it's Martin Scorsese. I gotta go. And uh, I went, and it wasn't that at all. It was like about a priest going into Japan to uh, rescue another priest who may have been uh, captive during a time when the Japanese government was killing Christians, and so he has to um, hide with uh, other families and like basically like sneak his way across the country because it's super obvious like he's a, a fucking you know jesuit priest in the middle of japan they're gonna catch him and um it's not like a preachy conversion movie uh he like he he just meets and finds other christians along the way and it's just like it's a great movie about uh faith and uh you know uh devotion to it and uh i did not see the ending coming and uh, i just it's exquisitely filmed it's martin scorsese at the top of his game i think um and uh andrew garfield phenomenal i was i was blown away um yeah silence great film number six is queen and slim Queen and Slim. Nice. So th this movie d has not been getting talked about a lot. Not at all. I'm and shocked. It's a fucking shame, especially with everything that's going on right now. This movie is so fucking important and is incredible. It's got Daniel Kaluuya in it, and I don't know the girl's name, but I'll put it up. Um, Jodie Turner Smith, I believe. Yeah, I believe that's it as well. She, they, they're just both so incredible and it's such a just true telling of like a, of, a, of a love story you know it's like it, it unfolds completely naturally and realistically and you know you truly just get to experience this just intimate like moments that these 
people have in like just this like horrific experience in their life and yeah it's just it is just so devastating and beautiful and sad and you should watch it queen and slim oh uh, yeah I, I i agree it is not talked about uh, enough it's not on my list um it was on my top 10 of last year though and um yeah i i absolutely loved it um and I'm surprised, like, even, you know, when I see on Twitter, you get, uh, you see threads like, you know, here are films from, from black filmmakers to recommend and stuff like that. And Queen and Slim is never on it. Like, it's, it's, even the people who are, like, wanting to only, like, focus on, like, black and female filmmakers aren't talking about it. And I'm just, like, shocked that so many people haven't seen this movie. It's so good. All right. My number six is Christopher Nolan's Dunkirk. Uh, maybe we'll get a chance to review this one day because I'm down to see it again on like 70 millimeter or something. Um, but yeah, I've uh, seen it a couple times in 70 millimeter and uh, once in IMAX um, for the shift in ratios. And um, yeah, I really love that Christopher Nolan. Uh, he really challenged challenged himself with this movie. Um, he he kind of uh, cut back on the exposition, um, cut back on like. A story about a guy whose wife died, um, and just there, there really is no thorough character arcs in the movie. There are little arcs, um, just like this person has to do this task or has to get somewhere. But it's the movie is not this really. This person must overcome this emotion. I, the 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 family on the boat actually. Uh, they they're the emotional core of yeah, the yeah. film, um, and so there still is that element, but. I, I just feel like Christopher Nolan challenged himself with this one, and um, yeah, it's, it was great. Yeah, I um, let me talk about that one later. <laughs> um, my number five is The Hobbit. The Desolation of Smaug. But um, so yeah, the one film or yeah, the one, yeah, the one film. Yeah, so. Um, yeah, the uh, the Hobbit Desolation of Smaug is just it's just amazing, you know. Like whenever uh, we we actually have uh, detail like detailed reviews of yes. the Hobbit, go if, check it if out. You if you have you, three hours, you care. go. <laughs> <laughs> you want to listen to people fan out over the Hobbit for three hours? Check out our review. Um, but yeah, this one is just the one that I look forward to the most uh, when watching the trilogy, and it's just a perfect centerpiece. Got to watch that extended edition, and um, yeah, it's like I, I won't talk about it much because I've already I've talked about it so much on this channel. But um, reminder that this is a favorite list because yeah. you know Queen and Slim objectively a better film, um, but favorite. Yep. And Hobbit was awesome. Yeah, Hobbit is <laughs> all right. So, yeah, there you go. Uh, my number five is mid-90s. For the reasons you said, I remember that moment after the the movie ended and uh, we just we sat there in just silence, just soaking it in. Just, uh, yeah, just, it, it just, it, it really hit us hard. Um, and, yeah, the, the use of 16-millimeter uh, film, the, the movie just, it's so accurate in its depiction of the 90s that it could be a, like, found indie film. Like there, I maybe there's an anachronism, uh, anachronism somewhere, but uh, t to me it it looked incredibly accurate and uh, yeah, just a really touching and uh, relatable story. Honestly, like I don't relate to many of the movies on this list. This is the only movie where I just like I really relate to this main character and uh, yeah. It's true. All right, my number four is Dunkirk. So, Cheers. Yeah, I had to uh, had to put this one on the list. Um, just just uh, you know, you have to have Nolan on on your list. He he released I think four just like uh, incredible movies in the in the 2010s. But I think that this one two incredible movies two good movies. <laughs> <laughs> I'll be that um, jerk. <laughs> Fair enough. Um, but, yeah, I think that, that Dunkirk is um, is the best out of them, uh, just for the experiences that I've had with it, 
And I think a little bit about what you said. It doesn't fit into the normal Nolan cliche. It's not trying to the have biggest thing like, is nonlinear editing. That's really the only like just strict Nolanism. In yeah, the movie. and and everything else is kind of just like telling a story. And it's like you know Tom Hardy fucking acts the whole thing with just like this part of his face. Yeah. It's just like yeah. you know like he's incredible. It's like the story is compelling. The, the plane sequence is my favorite part of the movie those are um, real spitfires by the way yeah yeah those are fucking real it, it's so <laughs> much of what they it has the record for the most uh, naval ships in a in a single movie and uh yeah it's uh, the things that they pulled off in this are just fucking unreal yeah um, and, the, and the tension they're able to build and it's pg-13 and did you like, did, did you know that there there was a clock ticking in the uh throughout the entire movie yeah and uh, it, it, it doesn't yeah, end it, until... It, it links into the, the soundtrack. Until yeah. he gets into the train and closes it, and then the t- clock stops. And they just, like, bring the volume in and out, and just, like, yeah, it's, it's like, wow. Yeah. <laughs> That's an easy effect to fuck up. Yep, it and is. And just uh, make annoying. Well, yeah, and just be like, why is there fucking... T- 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 t-? <laughs> you know, but, like, yeah, it's, like, it's it's great. And, you know, I, I just think that the... Especially the way that it's edited and how it tells the story and just how everything plays out. Um, Tom Hardy becomes ace pilot. You know, it's just it's just a phenomenal film. All right, my number four pick is the Hobbitses. I the, the Hobbit trilogy. I loved it. You know, I was skeptical too, and then when uh, I saw an unexpected journey, I was absolutely sold. I freaking loved an unexpected journey. I've been reading the Hobbit. For years and I always wanted it to be beefier I I always wanted it to be a longer book like I could read that thing in an afternoon um, and uh, yeah the movie just gave it to me and uh, Peter Jackson Philip Boyne's friend Walsh I think uh, you know I think they get way too much shit for their adaptation choices um, and that uh, people overreact to a lot of it uh, and uh, li- listen to their audio commentaries if you if you really want uh, like want to spend the time because uh, they're worth it and they defend every choice they make and they're all based on very I don't know just logical things that a writer would do and uh, I think it, I I love how long they are I just feel like I, I I would feel ripped off if they weren't close to three hours honestly <laughs> like if they were all a safe two hours you know let's show that shit as much as we can like i i i wouldn't be as satisfied i love that they were like yeah we're gonna make three hour movies again suck it <laughs> uh and then yeah desolation of schmog amazing follow-up was disappointed with battle of the five armies but it's still it's still great um but yeah overall i just uh one of my it's i i think um a lot of the other movies are objectively better but uh, I really looked forward to these movies, and I'm a massive Lord of the Rings fan, and I was totally satisfied. And uh, 2012 to 2014, just uh, anticipating those films was great. I I absolutely love the Hobbit trilogy. Um, and so yeah, no regrets. What do you got? All right, my number three is Once Upon a Time in Hollywood. Um, and yeah, just like you know, the well, like why not? Why not just put the hateful eight and Django on there as well? You know, they came out at, at the same time. They're all excellent. Dude, um, man, he killed it. Yeah, yeah, he just like QT man. What what the fuck? <laughs> you just fucking you just you just come at us with with just masterpiece after masterpiece. And uh, yeah, I love you for it. I love you. Um, you know, we've got. We've got a, a Once Upon a Time in Hollywood review. Go watch on our here. 70 millimeter review. Yeah, so go check that out and yeah, pass it on to you, my friend. Uh, my number three pick is Motherfucking Wonder Woman. Oh my god. I, I really loved Wonder Woman. Um, when the first time I saw it, it was the worst conditions. Um, I love showing up to movies early. We were late as shit. Uh, the, the seats we got were front row, far to the right worst possible seats you could have. I was super stressed out uh, because, like, I was in concessions and, you know, I was afraid I, I was I might miss the movie, and it was just, like, the worst possible way I could start 
uh, my movie experience and I, I just I had a blast I absolutely loved it and uh, yeah I was just like holy shit like uh, like you said D DC that was the moment that it was like okay um, and uh, yeah I, I, I saw it five times just because uh, it stayed in theaters for about five months and I just I just kept going back and then we uh, we drove to Seattle to go see it in 70 millimeter um, and I just find it to be an excellent hero's journey. Um, that it, it reminds me of, um, of Lord of the Rings, truthfully. I, I think it just, it has that sincerity with emotion. Um, the, you know, the MCU films have uh, conditioned audiences to love just like breaking, uh, dramatic moments with jokes and, and kind, kind of, of bathos. and kind of being afraid of being uh, just like sentimental and emotional and letting the music swell. There's just like terrified of being perceived as cheesy, and Wonder Woman is not afraid of that. Okay, my number two is the Andy Circus Planet of the Apes trilogy. Um, this this. Like War for the Planet of the Apes specifically, like I, I, I you know, Dawn, uh, I think um, Rise is uh, yeah, we're letting letting them cheat. Yeah, is like Rise is you know it's it's okay. Um, Dawn is like phenomenal, and War for the Planet of the Apes is a fucking masterpiece. And it's like this trilogy, just watching Andy Serkis play a character from literal birth. To to his, his entire lifespan in a, a section of three movies is just amazing to behold. The 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 like level of motion capture technology that they had to advance to just be able to film these films was revolutionary and changed the way that motion capture is done. Um, again, again, <laughs> <laughs> like Andy Serkis is the god of motion capture. Like he, he just he's on another level, and it's just this movie is this trilogy is so good, and is just a a true story of of oppression and prejudice and the seeking of freedom, and it's just it's phenomenal. Yeah, I, I didn't put it on my list, but yeah, I think I think it's one of the best trilogies ever. It's better than the Hobbit trilogy. Um, like it's like this Lord of the Rings, Godfather, Star Wars. Um, like it's it's up there. Uh, yeah, it's it's in. It should be in your iconic tier of trilogies. And I don't think it gets talked about enough. It does uh, not really. I uh, yeah. Yeah. We drove to Hollywood Theater to go see that. Yeah. And I, because I missed it in theaters originally, and when I got to see War for the first time in, on the big screen with just all the build up, it was just like it, it blew me away. It was number two for sure. Um. Okay. So my number two, I know in the Quentin Tarantino list, I put Hateful Eight as my number one because it, the difference between Best of the Decade and Best of Tarantino. I just feel like Hateful Eight is totally appropriate for my best of Tarantino list. I, I know it makes no sense, but when, when I'm when I'm making my best of the decade, I just like I, I just didn't feel like putting Hateful Eight as my number two film for the entire decade. Um, and so, you know, I gotta go with the movie I saw ten times, Once Upon a Time in Hollywood, for my number two. Um, Another movie I just kept going back to, you know, I intentionally wanted to see it on as many formats as possible, but even in our 70 millimeter review, I was like, oh yeah, this is my seventh time, it'll be the last one, and then I saw it three more times. <laughs> like, um, but I just think, I, I think it's such a challenging film, because on the surface, so many people just think it's... It's just Tarantino telling you about his references, and oh, he likes movies and feet, and oh, fuck, isn't he fuck? <laughs> like, I, it's so much more than that. And uh, the the references throughout the movie are not random. They are so purposefully used uh, to communicate the themes of his film, uh, which, like the fact that uh, most of the celebrities we see are celebrities that died too young. Um, 
and uh, there's more. Go watch our review. Uh, yeah, Once Upon a Time in Hollywood just truly is uh, something else. It's about loving movies. It's about watching movies. It's about making movies. Um, so, yeah. Peter, what is your number one pick? You probably already know. Dude, I think I but, do. Um, yeah, so this movie, I, I got a lot to say about it, so I, I, I won't build up any more suspense. It is Terrence Malick's A Hidden Life. Oh, yeah. <laughs> um, this movie was the most emotionally impacted I had ever been from a film, ever. Um, I legitimately, for like two minutes after it finally cuts to black, I just, I just cried in the theater. I was like so moved by what I had just seen. So many of the moments were so relatable and that like I personally had experienced in my life, you know, like like the the moment when he comes back from the army the first time and like the they he he embraces his wife it's like fucking just done so well and so beautifully and just like you just watch this family get fucking tested for the fucking worst reasons and just seeing this person just be unable to fucking do something that they know is wrong and to just do everything you can to stand up against what you know is wrong, it, it, regardless of the of the circumstance, and it's just like it is so heartbreaking and fucking horrible and amazing and beautiful and just relatable and relates to what we're going through right now and just like watching somebody just like make the right choice, you know, like. Yeah, it's just it's it's amazing. You you guys need to need to go watch a hidden life. Unfortunately, it's such a hard film to watch in terms of it's hard to find. Yeah, I'm pretty sure it's streaming, but if you want a hard copy, it's uh, it's tough. Um, okay. Speaking of the great Terrence Malick, my number one film is The Tree of Life. Um, I I think it is the best movie of the decade. Um, it's, it's the earliest film on my, li on my list, released in 2011. And, uh, you know, uh, truth be told, around 2006, I kind of uh, lost interest in movies um, and uh, really just only liked the things I already liked and was looking for more older films, but I just was... I just... I thought Hollywood and just most movies were just shit and uh didn't look forward to too many and uh lost my appreciation for cinema as a whole because of it and um yeah person a and i uh we went to go see the tree of life and it, it was just one of the most uh yeah just like you said emotional impact emotionally impactful experiences at the movie and i had no, I had no idea what it was about it's like, oh, Brad Pitt's in a movie, and let's go on a date. <laughs> like, and uh, I just, I was blown away. I was blown away by the narrative struct structure, by just like, oh, let, let's take 20 minutes to show the creation of the universe. Um, and uh, I, I loved that people were walking out. Um, I, I, I just... Um, I'll use the word again, challenging. I just, I love these films that just really just like challenge the audience and don't spoon feed them plot points and, uh, and just give them the same shit that they want. And, uh, yeah, the, the tree of life, it's, it's just, um, it, it just, I can't even find the words. It just—it doesn't even feel feel like I'm talking about a film. I know, right? Uh, it's, it's, it's like this. It's the same thing with with the hidden life. Yeah. Man. It's like Terrence Malick. I didn't know that you were going to be number one for both of us. But what <laughs> the fuck, man? Like, <laughs> uh, and uh, so yeah, at, at the at the end of the movie, uh, person A and I, we just we sat there and just just held each other and sobbed. It was just it was it was such a sad movie. 
and uh, and we um, you know the the film cut out. We saw an actual film print. It was back when that was still the standard, and uh, we we sat in the dark theater for so long that the theater shut down. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, we walked out and the doors were locked and we had to find somebody. <laughs> um, but, yeah. The Tree of Life. Terrence fucking Malik. It's uh, interesting, too, that my, my film is something he did at the beginning of the decade and yours is... Something he did, right? Yeah, he, him closing yeah. out the decade. It's crazy. Yeah, and so, like we said at the beginning, we don't share our lists, and so it's always, like, cool just for us <laughs> to see, like, how we re-rate things, you know? I, I honestly, uh, I knew that our, our lists were going to be different, but I was I was, I was was surprised that the, some of the ones we decided to put on there, uh, when we went to Seattle, um, we went to see Dunkirk and... Wonder Woman in 70 yep. millimeter, and both of those movies made it onto both of yeah, our well, lists. And, and that's part of it. It's just the the, the, the yeah. theatrical experience. Yeah. Yeah. It's just like it makes an impact yeah. on the you. The Cinerama in Seattle downtown is so fucking cool. It's yeah. awesome. That, it's like that was an amazing theater. Yeah. And, uh, and yeah. Yeah, and and yeah. I just I love movies. I really do, and uh, that's why we do this. And we hope you guys love movies too, because uh, you know that, that's literally what that's what this is all about, man. It's all it's about true. the love it's, of film. It's yapping. Um, so get ready for our worst of the decade list. It's happening. We're we're not pulling any punches. Yeah, we have to. Yeah. So see you guys next time. <laughs>